Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I know there was a bit of a rainstorm earlier, but we're glad you're here. Uh, welcome to Dia's Readings in Contemporary Poetry Series. My name is Megan Whitco. I'm an assistant curator here at Dia, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for our final reading of the spring series. I'm very pleased to welcome our two poets for tonight, uh, Maxine and Emily. Thank you both for joining us this evening. So Readings in Contemporary Poetry is a part of the Sackler Institute at Dia Art Foundation. And we also want to thank Levy Gorby Gallery who provides major support for the series. And additional support is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, as well as our media sponsor, the Brooklyn Rail. And we want to lastly thank uh, Brooklyn Brewery, uh, as well as Dia's staff, particularly uh, Mary Catherine Youngblood and Max Tanone, who help uh, coordinate all the details for the series. So if you've been with us before, we will not be having an intermission this evening, um, but following the reading, we will have a selection of uh, books by both of our poets for sale up front, as well as some of Dia's publications, and you're welcome to stay and chat or grab another drink if you like um, then. So I will hand things over to Vincent Katz, uh, who is our curator of re readings in contemporary poetry now, and he's going to be introducing our first reader for this evening. Good evening. Um, how's this sound out there? I was good. I was hearing a little echo something that I'm not used to. Usually we have perfect sound, so we'll get it, get it there, I'm sure. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming on this crazy, stormy evening. This is our last reading of this season, 2017-2018 season. We were excited to have Maxine Chernoff all the way from the Bay Area and our local hero, Emily Skillings, paired tonight. And, you know, with season, I mean, the series continues in the fall, so just check the website sometime in August, I would say. And, uh, yeah, look, everybody's here. So I'll, now I'll introduce Emily Skillings, who'll be the first reader. Emily Skillings is the author of the poetry collection Fort Knot, published by Song Cave in 2017, as well as two chapbooks, Back Channel, published by Poor Claudia in 2014, and Linnaeus, The 26 Sexual Practices of Plants, published by No Deer in 2014. Recent poems can be found or are forthcoming in Bomb, Boston Review, Brooklyn Rail, Harper's, Hyperallergic, Jubilat, Lit Hub, and Poetry. Skillings is a member of Belladonna, a feminist poetry collective, small press, and event series. She's taught poetry at Yale University and at the New School. She splits her time between Brooklyn and Hudson, New York. I love Emily's poetry because it reminds me of John Ashbery's, but it's not. Back in the day, as much as we loved John and his poetry, we had to scramble to find ways not to be engulfed by its overarching influence. In Emily's day, which is your day, she doesn't have to worry about that, so she doesn't, which means she's freer to open her poetry to that influence, to revel in its coursing through her veins. Also, there's a clear view of a woman here, so somehow she picked up that she could be elusive and also direct, disjunctive and simultaneously earthy, as in her poem, Back Channel, which begins, I buy an orb-shaped glass orb and a designer candle and go home to touch myself, take everything off but my shag coat, turn on some minimalist drone sent to me by a man, there's a lot of learning which she wears lightly. She can toss off Cranach the Elder and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, or more precisely, quote, the expressionist skyscraper proposed but never built by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, 
by, for Berlin's Friedrichstrasse. I sense a pattern by which she continually binds the present moment to various points in the historic framework. I, for one, find that end endlessly stimulating. Her poem based on the idea of breastfeeding leads to a revelation, quote, I'm not even thinking now, just acting, pure, unbridled, physical being. She does that via her poetry, and I'm jealous. I'll probably never write a poem from the point of view of one providing milk, but that's not what I'm jealous of. It's that pure, unbridled, physical being that Emily in it enacts so gracefully in her poems. Please welcome Emily Skillings. Thank you, Vincent. That was so beautiful. I'm so touched. Um, thanks also, Megan. Thanks to everyone at DIA. And I'm so excited to be reading and honored to be reading with Maxine tonight. Um, you did that magical introducer thing where you read, you quoted a lot of the poems I'm going to read tonight, <laughs> which <laughs> seems to happen a lot. Um, so I am actually going to begin by reading a couple new poems because if you don't like them, then there's the old stuff. Um, um, so for an, like a kind of old new poem, they're, and they're both John Ashbery related. The first time I saw John Ashbery read, I think was here in 2011 with Paulo Javier, um, which is an incredible reading. Was that 2011? Yeah. Um, and it was just amazing. And so I always associate this room with, with that reading, which kind of blew my socks off. Um, I wrote this poem before John passed away, but um, kind of very much thinking about a, a world without him. And then when he passed away, I realized it was a kind of elegy, um, and it's dedicated to him. It's called No People in It. I flutter in order to enter the phrase's silver. Jackdaws have launched nearby this time silk green and ripped, the movement a kind of chafing thinking. Oh, he's marking terrain right there, right there with his unmade song. The shadow kids whip Franz froth air up into heat, pure and simple violence of the eye, wild iris ink wet in the margin stage. Well, hadn't this testament begun to carry its chime and stripes? That's when I knew he was going away from me, towards the sound. Like the ring on the table, it can't be decentered. Rim around the recent ashes, ashes, a bright, tangled seeming. This is a brand new poem also known as a poem that I kind of finished working on a first draft of today. So thank you for listening to it. It's not there yet, but I'm excited to read it out loud and the audience is kind of intimate, so I feel okay. Um, I was in Germany for about a month this winter um, and I was at the edge of this public forest. Um, I had been talking with my friend about what was like the worst first line for a poem <laughs> and he offered up I love nature. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, that's a great first line. <laughs> um, so that's okay. And it starts with a with an episode. I was like, I'll do that. Um, it starts with an epigraph by John Ashbery from his poem The Instruction Manual. The Duke's Forest. What more is there to do except stay? And that we cannot do. John Ashbery. I love nature, <laughs> but I think it awakens in me intensely boring thoughts that in the moment seem deep ravines and when revisited later have lost the light and dark greens, the wet wood and expansiveness. See, there I go, sniffling. I'm an American in Germany at the edge of a public forest Today, families were out walking. 
the phrase taking my constitutional, something I've never said aloud, kept waving its little kerchief in me. I walked four miles alone, feeling very pleased with myself. I wish a sweater could come in that shade of neon moss, I thought at one point. I walked into a clearing and gasped at a dark primal energy that indoors now seems silly and evacuated. In the Duke's forest, I find myself listing the names of plants it has omitted. The morning refreshingly flowerless, no lady slippers, oxlip, wood sorrel, no violets, or ghost orchids. I could go on. I go on. This is why I love James Schuyler. He doesn't care that, quote, the plants against the light which shines in is a dull observation, or that, quote, trees and trees, more trees, is just the layered visual experience we all have in the forest or in the city with its buildings, waiting to let ourselves take in the sign to turn back, go home, and really hate someone. <laughs> Most days I say as, stay as close to bed as possible, even in my mind. I trust my brain when she's indoors and can bounce the materials that seem to float towards and away steadily in equal measure, creating a kind of scrim of thought over the body, off the surfaces of a room, mirrors, chairs, passages from books, the objects that ask me daily to love them. They soak in my attention and return it as color, out in the woods, there is a refreshing smell of decay. Today I saw nine pussies in the trees. One was forest art, carved by someone I felt I'd already met. It had a wooden jewel or egg inside of it, the size of a football, which I manipulated hesitantly with my hand. The other eight were naturally occurring. On my little walk, I scratched my asshole vigorously, right in, <laughs> right in front of a German family. Mama, Papa, two kids, two little white dogs. This gave me great energy. At some point, I broke off the path of the Hutwald to access a large termite-ridden tree, climbing into her large opening, leaning back like you might do on a long bus ride. The feeling is gone. There was a little milky stream just beyond it, and beyond that a tree had fallen. No, broken in half, the trunk was still firmly rooted. Perhaps many years ago, was carved to look like the top of the base and the bottom of the top half are interlocking, a single chain link connecting the two. It's actually hard to describe what this looks like, this cloven looming thing. The smart wicked from me, mind of wild dirt holes. Perhaps you will see something better, wood embracing at the wound of separation. In Paris, I bought you the morning of the poem at that tourist trap bookstore, mostly because you'd previously expressed your skepticism regarding my devotion to it, as you tend to question the value of things I love. You became drunk and silly on it, the opposite of my intended effect, began buying yourself cut flowers and placing them in the window to take their picture. It seems you are now quoting extensively from one of my favorite works of American poetry and a long poem you are writing to another woman. My student just submitted a brilliant and impossible poem in which the forest extends to include and contain everything so that a forest becomes indefinable, a catch-all container for experiences, detritus, life. He writes, quote, and when I say forest, I do not exclude, and then goes on seemingly to list everything that has ever existed in the physical world, beginning with spaces like highways, medians, estuaries, meadows, parking lots, drainage, ditches, clearings, and continuing on with sprawling lists of garbage, thoughts, feelings, limbs of baby dolls, the lost objects of an entire nat national consciousness. 
I'm so jealous of this poem. But the thing, but the thing about being outside, you can't really stay there. It's getting a little late, and the panic light is seeping in at the edges. I'm in the dark of a library with slightly bacterial wallpaper, reading men I love. And when I say that, I do not exclude you. It had been so long, though it hurts, blasts me, repeatedly, unendingly. I want to go back home, a feeling with many thresholds, with many names. So that when he writes, quote, night slams gently down, I am not my own way. In fact, I am far from my own ways. So now I'm going to end with some poems from my first book, Fort Knot. And it feels kind of nice because I feel like I'm going to stop reading from it after this for a while. It came out in October, and this feels like a really wonderful place to kind of like not do, like to, to, to put it aside for a little bit and start working on other things. So it feels like a wonderful space to do that. Um, this first poem is called Garden of Slow Forms. And I guess I was trying to imagine the inferno, like Dante's inferno, as like a really pleasant step to garden. <laughs> garden of Slow Forms. In the middle of your life, it is a Sunday. Shocked blossoms rush network, embed freely. You decide to take your new throat for a walk and track a softening center ring of thought. The daylight is scrolling itself to death. Everything presses into an atmospheric parfait, objects held by mounds of soil on and off themselves in neat rows. The available openings open wider open. Slits and bunches grow wild terminals. A lake explodes in a nearby district. A heavy storied tree line stores a form. Instrument of indecision, the calabash harp, harp combs into a cream colored fog. Matron of Now. There are so many paintings of Lucretia stabbing herself and they're all pretty terrific. My personal favorites are the ones where she looks bored, Rembrandt, Parmigianino, Salire, Cronach, the Elder, like she's just sticking a casual reminder between her tits that life is suffering, <laughs> and a certain quota of daily blood is needed for a decant into that ancient ceremonial chalice of feminine shame. Drip. Reclining on a sofa in the mid-century style, I allow a stranger's black and white boy cat with bright pink rubber caps on all its claws and a clipped tail to knead a soft space, the shelf of fat above my organs. It feels invasive, but not unpleasant, a therapy taken in foggy discomfort. Caught in my phone's own beam is my greasy face which, downturned, admires the expressionist skyscraper proposed but never built by, by Mies van der Rohe for Berlin's Friedrichstrasse, its points pointing at an overgrowth in me, my finger hovering over the street, no vehicles below, no people, the black smudge of city movement implying by erasure those who move through its striated dynamic soot. And what of the top? a blade garden, full of women seeking aesthetic revenge. I think I might like to go away. I think I might like to bond with the darkest stuff, revisit the peeling corner that exists in almost every room and is exquisite artwork that nobody looks at, to sit with it a while until a feeling of lateral motion takes over, a whisk into a sequential of senses from different legendary themes. And now the cat, is on the dining room table, licking goat cheese from an earthenware bowl. The big windows let the night in on a timer. The room does its thing to me again. Your lips, your eyes, that gentle shuffle of petals across the brain.
When I was a glacier. That Bruegel painting of hunters returning in winter, the filmmakers go nuts for it. A sad rabbit on a stick and more. It's like really in there tonally, a male disappointed group trudge towards a more lighthearted communal flurry, women and children full of fire, upholding weird roofs, doing their real work. A moment ago, I moved something not particularly large to the other side of the table and felt so old and immense and in control, like a truck crunching on its path. I project white onto the floorboards. And isn't it this music from that ballet that always makes us indistinguishable from a folktale pink shock of pure quartz through the wall? Give me one irregular mark for my thigh to pit the year against. 16th century sound gets all over the daybed, and you relocate your teeth to the opposite nipple. My thought in that moment, it's a brutal cave. Brightest bird, tail feather, increasing gray line, fail me my distant mountain. Please still invite me over to your house after I read this next poem. <laughs> it's called, I Love Wiping My Dirty Hands on Other People's Things. <laughs> it has always been the case, a pleasure I action, a small protest I smear my dirt redistributing as I cross over to the east side, hands building a serum out of the day. I wipe mayo onto microfiber car seat, makeup to underside of heather gray couch, into that damp, fresh hotel white, excess lotion on a colleague's ottoman upholstered in damask roses. Something you put in me gets painted on eggshell walls. I polish the side of your mouth with a greased thumb, thinking of how when John Cage studied architecture, he would carefully rub oil from his face into tiny wooden boxes he'd fitted. A silver pool gathers somewhere low and bratty in me and seeps outward. I know I own all this, the way the overcup oak claims the ground, the sloping windshields, the slow-moving residents with resinous, sticky dust. In Borum Hill, I apply my friend's $100 whipped breeze marine, white and cold as rabbit fur in its porcelain tub. Ignore the little plastic spatula designed to discourage the contaminated hand from intruding. I dip the pads of three fingers. Waves of ancient minerals crash across my face. I smell like a new coin. The cream is not the same for it. Tomorrow, I'll be whisked into the corners of her eyes as I walk down the stairs, fingers attending to the folded band-aid that has adhered to itself in my back pocket, old brown blood like a token. The tea grows stronger. I have infected the air around my house with my house's cake. If you teach me to behave out there in the grids and ways, I will pluck a hair from my filthy head and place it in your mouth. So this next poem starts with a nod to Eileen Miles, who says, in The Importance of Being Iceland, she says, poets aren't smart, there's something else which is something that I've kind of carried around with me for a long time and I find very soothing. <laughs> um, and then it ends with a line from The Clash. Fort not. I'm not really that kind of smart. Sometimes I can hardly. I hear a little bell and a film gets all over. Twice yesterday, actually, the imagined consensual entered held on to for a long time. A shriek parade was ordered by the county. The gender I wanted to become was actually more of an arm movement, simultaneously strong, accurate, elegant, lilting, and weaponized. 
Scrolling white text opened to doors of previous anticipations. The opening credits came on last, all puffed out with options. I did this very gentle tapping to activate the month in my skull. I watched some massage-related porn for purely relaxational purposes. Locked violets and crystals in the gun safe. Mold, it bloomed on the ceiling in the museum of best practices. Everyone got sour. If it's okay to cry in this widening, groaning hall, I'll do it after I sign for the deliveries. The smallest muscles in my hands are hard at work generating a closeness to God that is rare in these parts. When I end the American movie and it rains all over the Puget Sound, will you shepherd me to the opposite of safety? Place one hand at the small of my wreck. Pour out every single refreshment. There's so many savings and so little time. Sally wore a bathing suit. Nobody's home at the Holiday Inn Express. The scenic route drowned a long time ago. Didn't you know? Water froze in the generation. I'm just going to read two more poems. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. Um, this next one, I go, I'm on, I go on Etsy a lot. Um, not really to buy things, just to kind of like hang out with objects. <laughs> and so the title of this poem is from Etsy. Complete set of depression glass. which I might have thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid of hurting everybody, no anybody. In the house, I drink only what pools in the smallest concavities. The blue light is mine, the tin cup, a drop, a string horse. A failing tree produces my replica. I learned everything the hard way except nothing. I learned it hardest leaning against a fence. Heart, glands in the roadway, weight on one leg, ventilated, still and unchanging. Any couch can see I'm afraid of doing. I let things happen in a loose smock, moving on thought and want. Tendrils of saliva fill the pod of the mouth. The complaining terrain pounds the eye. Conversations over bread replace the bread. I get so relaxed, it kills my whole family. I might wear my flower suit into town, perfume the insides of my eyelids. What's easy isn't always visual. The green and dirt will soon tear out the snow. My friend picks me up in her new car, we drive towards a still place inside the calendar year. She leans across the console to say, you should really stop tinkering over the same old river, the same one you'll call gray and the next day call gunmetal, the same one you'll drink from, the same one you'll cross, the same one you'll drown in while you think you're being carried. This is my last poem. Thank you so much. It's called Carpet Town. My mother bought a really ugly carpet a few years back. <laughs> she told me how much she spent on it. And it wasn't even, it, it was just like a bad version of something that could have been a good carpet, but I became so obsessed with it and the colors were so disgusting and they were all up against each other. And then I kind of fell in love with it looking at it. Carpet Town. I walked into the ugly carpet and decided to live there. Everyone was there already. All the cats I ever loved, my favorite sodas and snack cakes. Most of my friends and family, their names were slightly altered, but only by a few letters, and they were people I loved and recognized. I wasn't worried. I found a warm spot on the southeast corner near the puke green stripe and settled in 
really got comfortable with the tinny sounds and the body soil and the faint feet smell and the squeaking sound like grass weeping whenever you moved or someone greeted you with a wave or a deep bow. And I was in love with the way the carpet held you in place inside a delightful straitjacket tightness. I enjoyed the way the green and red fibers almost mixed at my border but didn't. It, rem it made me remember bifurcated fields of flowers. I was sad for a minute and missed nature. I started a lucrative dish delivery service for people who needed more dishes or just wanted new ones. Then something really weird started to happen. All of my friends' faces, the people I knew from before my carpet days, from tongue red and ass foam, spirulina and marmite beige, they grew metal faces. They had been dipped by something, held by the feet, and lowered into a vat. Their gestures made eerie sounds. They stopped talking. I was scared. The carpet loosened around us. I grabbed my favorite dishes and hid inside a fiber loop long enough to catch my breath. It was getting dark as I began to wonder where I might put my face to sleep. I walked until I reached the edge. I could hear the low howls of the dead. The cats had followed me. I always do dumb shit like this. Thank you. Maxime Chernoff is the author of 16 books of poetry, including The Turning, To Be Read in the Dark, A House in Summer, Without, Here, and most recently, Camera, published by Subito Press in 2017. With Paul Hoover, she translated the selected poems of Friedrich Herdelin, published by Omnidon Press in 2008, which received a Penn Translation Award. She is co-founding editor of the long-running and award-winning journal, New American Writing, and has reviewed fiction for the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, and New York Times. She lives in Mill Valley, California. Sometimes in Maxine Chernoff's poems, the listener is swept along by a rhythm so compelling, it causes the mind to drop whatever it was contemplating and sit transfixed as the poem rolls by, a distant freight train traveling to an unknowable destination. Quote, the mountain's white page got lost in the story as did the knowledge of cave's deep plunge, a woman sat weeping. From how I wrote certain of my books. As she puts it at the end of a poem from her recently published collection, Camera, the material world holds issue, no issue. Elsewhere, her language spreads more languorously, as in this section from her poem, Findings. A, a cape of rain, season's slow reply, falls on lips, words shipped, a canopy of salt-filled sky, eyes wander, grass gives way, and words bend earth. Sky's whiteness capping afternoon. In all her various modes, Chernoff eschews both narrator and narrative, relying instead on declarative statements, eyes wander, or passive voice, words shipped. But the poet remains a consistent presence, subtly crafting the reader or listener's responses by what she judiciously leaves in or out. As she knows, and lets the reader know, words bend earth. But the poet would never presume to tell us what to do with that knowledge. Therein remains the inexhaustible promise of her poetry. Please join me in welcoming Maxine Chernoff. We have to make me shorter here. I can't make, I can't even become shorter, but the microphone needs to become shorter. 
Okay, I'm going to read. Thank you very much, Vincent, and thank you, Emily. A wonderful event, and thank you all for coming out on this rainy night. Um, glad you're here. I'm going to read a few poems from my previous book here, and then I'll read mostly from camera. <clears throat> this is called a, The Staggering Man. A staggering man is carrying a salad across the street. This is not the first line of a word problem about velocity or distance. I am waiting for him to cross, and we have locked eyes. He is grimacing or smiling at me. I am smiling back. The man has a disorder that makes his case singular. It has a name and a prognosis. He is one of a galaxy of staggering men whose provocation is unclear. I have seen them stagger in other arenas, and I have ignored their staggering in moments of disregard. The staggering man is finally across. My pen is out of ink, and I am writing with a crayon I found inside the seat. Turquoise, I would say, but Indian blue, its appellation, perhaps about the ocean. I haven't written so many poems since my 20th year, when my professor said he doubted a girl with my intelligence but emotional restraint could write a single word. It sounds as if he was unkind, but it was a kindness to me, a mirror to hold up to my shadows. The staggering man has disappeared. The afternoon is brilliant with invented weather and sky-framing clouds. Several pigeons are harassing a dove, which one of my students has told me is just a smaller, dumber pigeon. How are you today, my dear? Are you being viewed by someone who locks eyes with you and loves you? Have you read my parable and noticed its small devices? Will you judge me with a deeper love than I could offer the staggerers and plaintiffs earlier in my years and see how I see your eyes in their reasons? <clears throat> this is called Singular. Um, starts with two quotes, one from Whitman, Death's Outlet of Life outlet song of life, and Emerson, every man should be as much an artist that he could report in conversation what has befallen him. High-mindedness is a construct of mind and its metals, its iron and zinc, its blue mercury. It is a waste to consider how we relate to the human condition. We are the human condition in cotton and lace and charms that fit in thimbles. We are broken and fixed. We are mended and torn. We are the underlining of the soft bellies of kangaroos crossed with examination books. We tell jokes that aren't funny and laugh with our eyes closed. When we open them, someone has died and another been born. We praise Jove, we praise Allah, we praise the markdowns at the Nordstrom rack where a handsome young woman is weeping into her hands. We praise the immaterial essence of clouds that resemble your uncle on Wednesday. We praise the material grace of your hand on my collarbone, soft in its landing. We are unkind to our neighbors. We cheat on our friends. We are witnesses to the first bee in the jasmine we planted at noon. We are witnesses to the harms of a life and its slow repetition that leads to new beauty. We travel to see peasants enact old rituals that we would find foolish in our own doorways. We are peasants as well under our skirts and children and finally fools. Who knows the height of a well-bit arch or the dimensions for travel to Mars? If you fly there, you cannot return. There are those who will fly there. I've heard them on a show discuss how they'll grieve for irises and children and the small, fond expressions of those whom they love. We all leave cathedrals in ashes and bony candles burnt to their wicks. We all leave nothing we wanted and everything we did and that of an in-between state of a small conversation involving the beauty of spires. We are not jugglers. Planes fall and leaves too and nothing that crashes or lands without sound gets repaired. Our ankles have sight of the horizon of small endings. We look forward to more as we leave more behind. When my mother was dying, she asked, will I live? 
I remember the silence as she turned from our silence to make herself ready. The quiet of an afternoon in a room where light and sound were present, but respectful. I remember the quiet later that day as we stood alone with her. Absent at last, she withdrew with a tact, save for endings. Please save me from all that I know must follow. Please give me a book or a song or a look that means less. Okay, these are two little prose poems without titles. Um, for every appetite is the world, and that's Bachelard. You start in the movie with Maud Gone and Socrates and Juliet and a flock of sparrows that were a fixed point like the spire of a cathedral but made of feathers. You were naked and clothed and wearing nothing visible except when you sat or stood or began to speak. And then the words were made of black yarn and your fingers held them in an outline of reverie. You were there and not there and when I partially held you, the idea of you faded into a hint of light tinged by a window in the westernmost sky. And under that window, your face was vaguer and therefore more intimate in its shadowed complexity. If water is proof of thirst and knowledge a satisfied hour with a book, then stories end as they begin at the height of invention without a suffix of time and its pressures. You start in the movie and certain necessities fled like figures animated by their own recognition. Um, this starts with a quote by Paul Ricoeur, a secret dream of emulating the cartographer or the diamond cutter animates the historical enterprise. You're here on a couch, fellows fluffed, dreaming in Latin. You're in a tablet carved on a mountain given to men whose ears filled with ontology. You're near a stream whose source is the next cogency for a traveler stunned as Holderlin trying to remember his name. You're in the dream in which his hands are yours and conclusions marked by sighs and breathing. You are nowhere, a signal or code meant to sweep you under a wave or a cloud or a whispered veil of induction. The French Revolution began without you and ended the same. You are not needed in this chapter in which the king's clothes are described as raiment or ermine cloak. If you are required by time and its minions, you will receive notice as spiders when the dew shakes a web and the world blinks to attention. Okay, now my next book, Camera, um, it's kind of the same. This, this book was mainly long line prose poems. This one is not. That's, that's the difference. Um, I thought of this poem because of what's happening right now in Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip and my son having gone there about six years ago and already being horrified at what he saw before further horror. Event. An event must in some way end before its narration can begin, and that's Christian Metz as a um, film semiotician. Then the doves and the thrush and the late afternoon of the swallows under the bridge and the fathoms of sleep and then the hollows of dialogue aspiring to contain the rich facts of what didn't happen when it seemed to have. And then a disquisition on the luster of windows in the morning where a psalm is read before lighting, lightning strikes the spire of a tall church in the city of your birth. And then centuries of robes of saffron or black and vespers or prayer on cold granite at a wall where guards stand with AK-47s and ghosts witness their attempts with sorrow, unlike human sorrow, which is a stream that evaporates when language interrupts its flow. And the ministry of a quiet voice when what is needed is a bell or a glass filled to a certain level and made to vibrate with a spoon. And before this ending, another ending, and after that, another. And no agreement between parties as to whether the story is over or this is a respite between exhaustion and pleading. And the irises shallowly covered in dirt emerge purple in spring, world without end, as words are endless, sending their tendrils toward the next refrain. Um, this poem is called Preface and it begins the book, um, and it's a prose poem, and not many prose poems in this book. Um, starts with a quote from Fanny Howell, Lord, increase my bewilderment, 
and it has a date. It was written on um, the 20th of January 2014 at 2.45 p.m., um, which is Martin Luther King Day. Preface, the work of the moment. A life is celebrated and others are born and die as I write this sentence. There is the small hum of a machine that runs on the melted bones of dinosaurs and the smell of cut vegetation. There is the taste of salt on my knuckle and glaciers melting and fires in the south of my state. There are circumstances, there are feelings. There are connections to be made or not about memes and twerks and a YouTube video of Johnny Cash at San Quentin when all the prisoners were white. The work lives now and in retrospect. The work lives in an empire of great cruelty and wealth where the average citizen is punished daily and not given what she needs. Give us this day our gluten-free bread. Drones hit targets as we speak. The last bee in the garden has its singular existence as it approaches the lily and is part of a community whose existence is threatened by a plague and pesticides, and yet it cannot present its own case to the world. Hence, Emily Dickinson. That is the work giving voice to itself, holding within itself the deep notions of the moment. The poem's attention is also its ignorance. The work is beyond unkind to everything it omits. The work cannot fulfill its duties of repairing the broken world all around it. The work struggles to contain itself. It does not bleed to death or get crushed by an army. The poem sucks the nectar and returns to its hive. Um, I'm trying to figure out which one I was reading here. Um, called Afternoon. Yeah, Afternoon. And again, it quotes the semiotician film of film, Christian Metz, Afternoon. All one retains of a film is its plot and a few images. Um, but in a lot of these poems, I kind of oppose poetry to what film does. Their shadows carved in snow Ghosts wander in eternity, their habit of existence escaping our cognition until we surrender light and location, dried bark and dead leaves, decayed in their mystery no more than summer's cloth, lowered in the garden with its flowers behind flowers. Lost on the screen is the morning he said this and you that, and the future hummed in the bushes like a slow windowless fire. We haunt the world looking for ourselves, the ones who know the soft antler buds of deer. We forget the scene in the room of the said where curtains and bed and light latticed as lace made your face unfamiliar, mine too shrouded in layers of hope, which is as gauze a semblance of our hiding. As we open to the other beyond seasons and borders, the world, with everything in place, held small truths and when told by any voice. A vista and ledge, custom and dust of living spread. Our story obscure, the room shuttered, the lateness of the day a swift descent. You said a world that filled, a word that filled a momentary gap, lacing the world in tangled sound and string. Um, this is called Granted, again, Christian Metz. Um, a line is always, a film is always like a book and not like a conversation. As I saw your face nearing my face, snow fell through a keyhole and opened the door. We went inside and watched windows wax green and gold. Spring, we decided, was more oppressive than winter with its alyssum and clover and the sheer weight of life crowding us off the page. We stayed in bed for years and took our cures patiently from each other's cups. We read Bleak House and stored our money in socks. Nothing opened as we did. It's called The Possible. Um, begins with a quote from Wordsworth, The Stationary Blast of Waterfalls. The moss-covered birds I clean in the stream look at me clearly. A baby floats by, Moses? I am texting you when the dream concludes. So much to tend, oneself included, liminal clouds leaking cold rain. Location as anchor, an ivy-filled absence, 
the spoken as dirt surest witness. Awake to subtraction, seasons of smoke, Aleppo's horizons drop from the sky. Your private museum contains the world, which doesn't make sense, unless in a photo. But no, it is here, where our silkworms tend it, a milk-colored shroud cloaking its wounds. Future begins with a quote from Bei Dao, forbidden flowers and herbs are history's foodstuff. Old snow falls on this poem about the past, our lives remembered as funerals by those who never attend but imagine the slender coffin, the sheen of its bright handles. There on the dark lawn you meet your former self, asking a lover to step aside as memory impinges on an invitation to dance. The next scene comes unbidden as an outbreak of disease. There he stands with his eyes mercurial. There she weeps at her rendition of their sorrow. Snow falls on them both, laden with reasons and candles. And in the corner, a table is set where your former self shares its dinner with, one, with the one you have become. The radiant fruit you share has gotten overripe, waiting for its season. This is called totem. I don't know, it's a little different. I can't tell you what it is. It's just words. <laughs> totem. If the stars, then the running. If the grain, then the taking. Under stealth, then erasure. Reprobate until closure. If words, then horizons. Suffice to say bodies. Leeward when rising, then faces frame layer. If wanting, then touch. If vacant, then nascent. If sinking, then leaf line. The kneeling, then grass. If whispered to others, then children count ships, a flotilla of swan, if flotilla of meaning, then relations to squander, if the whole and if closure, then voices the breaking, if leave sign a locus, then ready and sentient. To own. I'm just going to read actually this one and one longer one. To own. And this is Metz again. The shot is an actual unit. The blistering shore where cliffs spawn birds among the ruins of olive trees tethered there. The hosts whose language makes them strange and bartered as life evolves around a plague-filled site we've come to call our own. The news is filled with one true plot that men make war and trouble stands to view the scene. The boss who orders workers to make jackets, bombs, or pies. Whose ghost will take the blame for all the dying and the leaves? What world kills seeds and makes the bees lose their high season, thick with industry? Cue the stinging rupture, which we mean to take a death has been inscribed upon the day we crush the grapes and say the prayer, which still is offered for a reason split, a rift between this ledge and that. Here is the cortege holding meaning in its hands, the barest omens dense as bulbs we plant and fall. Seasons travel in the world of pure design. They're blooming to a death, though for the moment decorated as a bride. Um, actually, I lied. There's one poem before the last poem. Emergent. Um, Emily Dickinson's Sumptuous Destitution. Like wasps stinging in the unkind world where love is stretched and painted green, the dumb world gleaming like bells from a tower in a painting of a valley where a single puff of smoke translates the scene. Where to travel on the empty train? To sonify a spin-off, to spin a pearl, until its oyster closes on resistance, until its drift finds a ready landing in dark water, submerging to a place beyond eyes and the soft underpinnings of words. In spring, you want more. The pale leaves beckoning, the heart's easy notice, sky and belief part ways. The crisp, unseeming world readies for the task. Tell it something it can believe. And then I'm going to read this poem I wrote. Um, I was fortunate enough to be um, 
admitted not as a like year-long fellowship, which usually younger people get, but for a few weeks as a visiting scholar um, at the American Academy in Rome. Um, and as soon as I got there, my computer broke. So this poem I wrote on my phone, and um, I would just go around the city and see what I wanted to see and write things down, and it became this. Um, so it's a poem in a lot of little parts. Um, and I was particularly interested in going to Rome to see the Keats and Shelley sites and to kind of um, pursue what I had learned in my English literature classes <laughs> a thousand years ago. Okay, so Nole Mi Tangeri um, starts with a quote by Shelley. Go thou to Rome, at once the paradise, the gray of the city, and the wilderness. You find it there and pick it up, lost already in the language. Near Garibaldi's monument, blue blisters its limit. Untangled clouds gather, proper nouns amass. Try to keep it real, meets the ancient stone pine. All lenses point to Rome. First they came for the architecture. Harsh sun is closer here. Placards mark the rift, sacked and burned, just as today, Aleppo, Mosul, Bamiyan. Of Keats's grave, Shelley writes, an open space among the ruins, covered in winter in violets and daisies, his own near the top of the outsider's cemetery. Too tired to wear the earbuds for the film, every moment I observed was captured on his face, as if saying, I am here. Never, never sorry you exist, never say that, love. Holderlin saw the rift in the sky, black moon means hidden, he got a kill fee, she took her leave, literally and also not so. In what ways have I lost you? Say your treasons are legendary, you trespass on the world, its soil leaking remedies. You take the sacred root and gnash it in your hand, fingers yellowing. This is not your world. Take your hand and touch the stone. It is a stone. Above the outsider's cemetery, a shirtless man tends his geranium, memento mori with peroni. How he didn't go to Rome and slept alone for years. I visited her in her dying. She asked for a poem, which terrified me more than her dying. I wanted to take her up and somehow save her. No words for that. All the rye we drank later to forget. Twigs on the street form a lantern, then a leaf's interruption. May you find the form to enclose you, like the sycamore in its window, leaves disrupted by the starlings, black eminence backgrounding sun twice seen in the pain. As stories have two views, remember that partisans, as clouds shift from Dalmatian to Palomino, there is always more to tell. Regarding disruption, what scene had you in mind? Get back to me, please. For I exist to see you in your perfect rags and wounds. What we lose, we keep. Lavender sky at 6.02 a.m., partial cloud on a hill, the news as it flickers out like a star. Tourists everywhere, I among them, voices at the catacombs, those who came for the grand tour or in order to save their lives, Keats on his final green bed. The supplicants arrive, blessing the possible cure. Candles lit, coins tossed, as many hospitals as churches peer out from the ruins. Chosen as six years, most serve 30. If they broke their vows, the Vestal Virgins were buried live at Culling Gate, past which the bus travels daily. Here I am. Food and water for several days, because they could not technically be harmed, consenting to their deaths, proper maidens still. Full of affection and uncertainty, you are a galleon of flesh. You sail on the Tiber under the many bridges past the junction where cattle barges arrived to market three millennia ago. The sacrifice of living is to see. So much invisibility, how the missing among us measure their days by color of the sky, whispering whom they love, dear faces all as charms. Pristine among the rooms, the small temple to Caesar. 
perfect in its roundness, everything coherent once, discreet as that bush where sparrows practice divination by gathering crumbs. I divine my love, his lips, his voice in my ear, my eyes his. The cloister where nuns pray, demolished and then rebuilt, enduring through devotion. Alessandro, the taxi driver, tells me about the Nobel Prize. Bob Dylan, Musica, Genio. Rain's particular measure is voiceover for the day. History rewriting its future in the innocent eyes of saints. Saint Kafka of Prague. Find a vacant corner where the light gives off some warmth, all the piety you'll need. You slept too late and loved the day, from macadam to frescoed ceiling. San Luigi di Francesco's dark corner of Caravaggio's, filled with agony and light, the human scale. Our bodies are smaller than the head of Juno, and suffer more than representation can depict. Here is the bust of Goethe, marble's equanimity. And yet to say it all is not enough. Your shadow cast on the Tiber, the fleet passing of your chance, witnessed and enacted. This too is not the sum. When you leave, others will arrive to bless the air. Thanks. <laughs>